Hi, good morning and welcome to Pause. I've been uh, looking at this book, Saints on Earth, a biographical companion to common worship. Um, I know you would never have pegged me as somebody to be reading this book, but that, that's fine. But in it, it goes each day when there's a particular saint that's being celebrated, it just kind of gives you a short bio. And the thing that's taken me is uh, uh, the Bishop of Lincoln, or Hugh, the Bishop of Lincoln, who uh, was around around the 1200. And it's really struck me. And I'm just going to read a little section from this because it's just an amazing bit about who this person was. And we kind of forget. We don't learn from the people of history. So here's a, a little excerpt. So Hugh was born at Avalon in Burgundy about 1140. He was groomed by his father to become a member of an order of canons. However, he preferred the harsher religious life of the Carthusians, a contemplative monastic order. And he joined the community uh, when he was 25. Now, a bit of time between that, but in 1186, Henry appointed Hugh, so this is King Henry, appointed Hugh as the Bishop of Lincoln. And Hugh showed his freedom of spirit by refusing to accept the position until he was elected by a free vote of the cathedral chapter. So he wasn't willing to be a pawn of the king. Lincoln, at that time, was the largest diocese in England. And Hugh was particularly careful in the quality of people to whom he delegated much of the work. And so Hugh has actually become highly thought of by King Henry II. And so consequently, he was frequently called upon for advice or counsel. And in that time, Hugh was not afraid to demonstrate his independence from royal control. And kind of like before Thomas Becket, before him, he always championed the freedom of the church from the state from state intervention and so he had no hesitation in speaking his mind when the need arose. Hugh also, in this great, refused to raise money that was demanded by King Richard II to pay for his participation in the Crusades. This was the first time of note that a royal request for money had been refused by the church. But Hugh's actions only served to enhance his reputation, and his relationship with King John, though, was less successful. However, as Hugh was constantly challenging the king over matters of faith and conduct to which the king refused to respond. And in response to an Easter sermon by Hugh, King John walked out halfway through, unable to stomach the demands upon the kingly authority that Hugh was making. And although Hugh was a bishop, Hugh would also spend time each year at the monastic community in Witham. And his reputation as a fair judge uh, got larger, as did his heavy workload within the diocese and for, for the state. But he also had several disagreements with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter. Now, Hugh was ill, and when Hugh was dying, the Archbishop suggested that he should take the opportunity of repenting of his rudeness to him. Hugh refused and replied to the Archbishop that he wished he had been ruder still. Now Hugh had been said to combine, people had seen that he had combined something of the power and attractiveness of Cuthbert, who was the Bishop of Lindisfarne, with the love and compassion of Francis of Assisi. And Hugh's understanding of the suffering of Christ greatly affected his work and his relationship with others. And that kind of got me thinking that actually through the whole of Hugh's life, you got to see that his understanding of Christ and what Christ did for him affected how he operated with other people. And in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul the Apostle says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentiles. I kind of get a sense that the Bishop of Lincoln, Hugh, knew that he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that he kept on doing it, he kept on preaching the word. So he preached the word to King John. He wasn't going to f- be worried the fact that John was King John was sitting there. He told him, no, that's not right. Henry II, he, did, he kind of spoke against him as well and just said, look, I'm going to challenge you on different things. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and the demands it placed on followers of him. So if these kings stood for anything, that they should stand for Jesus Christ, and that would have a demand on their life. 
he stood that and said that to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter, that he turned around and, and said stuff to him and he kind of gets him a, a hint that he was probably quite rude to him. He said, look, whether you're the Archbishop or not, this is what Jesus demands of us. There is a real sense of somebody who is not ashamed of the gospel. That it's not to be dictated by anyone, whether a king or the state. And I love this. I, I love the fact that it's a challenge to us that actually, are we people who are prepared to not be ashamed of the gospel, no matter who we're speaking to, no matter where we are, no matter what organisation we're talking to, whether it's royalty, whether it's the church, whether it's a business, whether it's a school, whether it's our friends, whether it's our boss, that actually we are not ashamed of the gospel. And actually, if we're not ashamed of the gospel, maybe just like you, our reputation won't be diminished, but will get stronger. So just today, as you pause, as you reflect on one of the saints who lived his life out for God, for Jesus, maybe reflect on the verse that Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And what might that look like in your life? Thanks for coming. Have a good day and see you on Sunday.